All right, so in this example, we're going to do an optimization problem. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the area of the largest rectangle that can be inscribed in the ellipse. And the ellipse is going to have, its equation is going to be given by x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. So it's kind of a com relatively common, I think, type of optimization problem you might see in a calculus course. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to graph that ellipse x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1. I've seen a lot of people, when they approach this problem, they'll just make an ellipse and they'll put a rectangle in it, and then they don't know really what to do from there. But, you know, you've got a, a formula, an equation for the ellipse. So let's go ahead and graph it. So perhaps you have forgotten how to graph an ellipse. Okay, so, I mean, I've got videos on this, but the main thing you need to know for this one is it's centered at the origin. If you look underneath the x squared term, so the denominator is a 4, if you take the square root of that, you get positive 2. That's how many units it's going to go from the origin to the left and to the right. You're basically finding x-intercepts and y-intercepts is all you're doing. And likewise, if you take the square root of the denominator underneath the term involving y, well, the square root of 9 is 3. So basically, it's going to go up three units, down three units, to the left uh, two units, to the right two units. So, okay, my ellipse might not be, again, perfectly to scale, but whatever. There's, there's a rough graph of my ellipse. So, okay, so now what do we do? Well, we're trying to put a rectangle in there. And again, I'm trying to make that rectangle as large as possible, so... Okay, so, you know, my rectangle here, it's crossing at, 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 at positive 2 and negative 2. That's just coincidence, okay? So I'm not saying at all that's the correct rectangle. I'm just making a generic little rectangle. So, again, I need to come up with, with the, the formula. So what am I trying to maximize here? Well, I'm trying to maximize the area. And what is the area of this rectangle? Well, I don't know. So let's say generically this is sitting at some coordinates. Let's say it's touching the ellipse at the coordinates x, comma, y. Well, then what would the area of this rectangle be? Well, what does that mean? If, if I'm sitting at the point x, comma, y, that means I've gone over x units and I've gone up y units. Well, if I've gone over x, that means the entire width would be 2x. So that would be the width of my rectangle. And if this height denotes is y units, well then the entire height would be 2 times y. So the area of my rectangle generically is 4xy. And again, this is the thing I'm trying to maximize. So I want to take the derivative. So this is what I, I want to take the derivative because then I can find critical numbers and I can use the first derivative test to determine if the, where I get a maximum or a minimum. But the first thing I want to do is I want to get my equation, this equation, 4x times y. I want that to involve only the variable x or only the variable y. So it's, that way it'll be in terms of a single variable, and I can start taking the derivative. Okay, so to do that, this, this x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1, this is going to be my constraint. And again, you know, why can't my rectangle be as large as possible? Well, it's trapped or it's constrained by the ellipse. So I'm going to take this equation, x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 equals 1, and I can either solve that for x or I can solve that for y. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Well, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve this for y. So the first thing I'm going to do is subtract x squared over 4 from both sides. So on the left side, I would have y squared over 9 equals 1 minus x squared over 4. Now, the next thing that I'll do is I'm going to multiply both sides of that equation by 9. So I'm going to multiply the left side by 9. I'm going to multiply the right side by 9. So on the left side, the 9s would simply cancel out, and I would be left with y squared equals... Now, you could distribute the 9, but I'm not going to. So I'm going to have 9 multiplied by 1 minus x squared over 4. And the next thing I'm going to do now is simply I'm going to take the square root 
of both sides of my equation. So let me tidy things up here for a second. So now I'm going to take the square root of both sides of my equation. So I'm going to take the square root of the left, the square root of the right. Recall when you take a square root, you have to include a positive and a negative. Okay, so the first thing is I can simplify. Well, the square root of 9, that's going to be 3. And then underneath the radical, I'm left with 1 minus x squared over 4. Now, be careful. A common mistake is I've seen people, it's easy to try to simplify this, the square root by taking the square root of each term individually. Again, that's absolutely not correct. Okay, So, so one thing you don't want to do, again, kind of a common mistake here, you know, the square root of 1 minus x squared over 4, that's not going to equal 1 minus x over 2. This is kind of a common mistake I've seen. People say, oh, the square root of 1 is 1, the square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 4 is 2, and they'll somehow get this. And be careful, because that's algebraically not all, at all correct. So if that was your thought, just a little word of warning there. Now, since just based on my picture, the equation of this ellipse, the, the top half of it would be the positive square root. So just the top half of the circle would be the positive 3 times the square root of 1 minus x squared over 4. The bottom part of the ellipse, you could describe that using the negative portion. So what I'm saying is I'm just going to keep the positive part. I'm just going to use 3 times the square root of 1 minus x squared over 4. Okay, <clears throat> so that's what y equals. Now I'm going to, again, take my the, the equation I was trying to maximize. That's 4 times x times y. And I'm going to put this in there. So the area, all in terms of x, we said it's 4 times x times y. But now we have an expression for y. We said it's 3 multiplied by the square root of 1 minus x squared over 4. Well, we can simplify this. So again, I'm even going to emphasize that the area now all in terms of x. We could do 4 times 3, which would be 12. We have x. I'm going to rewrite this as 1 minus x squared over 4. And I'm going to write that to the 1 half power. Because again, I'm going to start taking a derivative. So this is going to remind me to use the, you know, you know I've got to use the product rule. And then I'm also going to use the chain rule. So, so now we're going to take the derivative. Let's take the derivative, again, using, we'll have to use both the product rule and the chain rule. And then we're going to do some algebra. Okay, so let's do that step next. So the 12x, I'm going to think about that as being one of my factors. And then my other one will be the 1 minus x squared over 4 to the 1 half power. So OK, a prime, there's my derivative. So if we take the derivative of the 12x, the derivative of that would just be 12. And then we'll leave the other factor alone, the 1 minus x squared over 4 raised to the 1 half power. Plus, the product rule has a plus. Now let's leave the 12x term alone. And now if I take the derivative of the other factor, OK, now I'm going to have to use the chain rule. So the 1 half will come out front. We'll leave the inside stuff alone. We'll take 1 away from the exponent. That'll give us negative 1 half. So x squared over 4, think about that as being, you know, so, so OK, so it's negative x squared over 4. You could think about that as being negative 1 fourth times x squared. So the negative x squared over 4, that's the same thing as negative 1 fourth x squared. Well, when I take the derivative, the constant comes along, I'll get 2x. So I would have negative 2 over 4, which would leave me with negative 1 half multiplied by x when I simplify. So now I'm going to clean this up. So now the whole point is, well, I've got the derivative. I need to start finding, I need to start finding critical numbers. But let's clean it up first. OK, so I see a positive times a negative. That's going to be a negative. I see a 12 multiplied by a half, or equivalently 12 divided by 2. That would be 6. 6 multiplied by another half would be 3. Again, I already accounted for the, the sign. I've got an x times an x, which is going to be x squared. And then I've got this 1 minus x squared over 4 raised to the negative 1 half power. 
So what I want to do now, again, is I'm trying to find critical numbers. So that's where this derivative either equals 0 or where it's undefined. Again, the points have to be in the domain of the original function. There's two ways to clean this up. I don't know which way. They're both equivalent. So one thing you could do is factor. I find sometimes that factoring might confuse people. So you, 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 one thing you can do is you can either factor. So now either factor or I'm going to write it as a fraction and get common denominators. Again, it all ends up being the same thing. I'm going to do, I'm going to get common denominators because I feel like usually trying to factor this sometimes throws people off. So maybe getting common denominators might feel a little more natural to you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave the first term alone. I have 12 multiplied by 1 minus x squared over 4 raised to the 1 half power minus, well now I've got 3x squared over, well this is being raised to the negative 1 half power, so I could put that in the denominator and raise it to the positive 1 half power. So now what I'm going to do is for my for my first fraction, or excuse me, for my, my first term, to get common denominators, okay, well this is all over 1, I'm going to have to multiply top and bottom of this by 1 minus x squared over 4 to the 1 half power. So I'm going to multiply top and bottom by 1 minus x squared over 4 to the 1 half. So there it is in the denominator, 1 minus x squared over 4 to the 1 half. The 12 is still hanging out. Well, if I multiply 1 minus x squared over 4 to the 1 half power to the numerator, I would have like bases, 1 minus x squared over 4 to the 1 half multiplied by 1 minus x squared over 4 to the 1 half. That's going to leave me with 1 minus x squared over 4 to the first power. And now I've actually got common denominators, so I can just write the minus 3x squared in the numerator. Okay, so now let's keep simplifying this. So if you want to, you could write the denominator as 1 minus, the square root of 1 minus x squared over 4. If I distribute, I would have 12 minus, let's see, I would have 12x squared over 4. So 12 over 4, that's going to leave me with a negative 3x squared. That's when I distribute. Notice we've got this additional negative 3x squared, so let's not forget about that term. Getting pretty close, so in the numerator, I've got 12, I would have minus 6x squared, when I combine my like terms, minus 3x squared minus 3x squared will be negative 6x squared. And then I've got the square root of 1 minus x squared over 4. Okay, so that's my derivative, nice and tidy. So two things. I've got to figure out where the derivative equals 0. So if a prime equals 0, that means we set the numerator. 12 minus 6x squared equal to 0. Okay, a couple of different ways to solve this. I think the easiest way, or at least the way I would probably do it, is I would add the 6x squared to both sides. That would give me 12 equals 6x squared. Divide both sides by 6. So on the left, I'll have 2 equals x squared. I'll take the square root of that. So x is going to be positive and negative square root of 2. And again, just the way I drew my picture, I'm going to let x equal the positive square root of 2. And if we take the denominator and set that equal to 0, because that's where a prime would be undefined. So I would have 1 minus x squared over 4 equals 0. If I multiply both sides of this by 4, well, I would have 4 minus x squared equals 0. If I add x squared to both sides, I'll get 4 equals x squared. And if I take the square root, I'll get x equals positive and negative 2. Now, at this point, if we go back to our picture, you can already rule out that x equals positive or negative 2 is not going to give you a maximum. Because again, let's go back to the original picture. You know, if, if x goes all the way out to positive 2, right, if the rectangle extended all the way out to positive 2, so I'm going to draw another little picture here real quick. So that's the x coordinate of 2. If the rectangle extends all the way out to positive 2, 
there's no height, right? I mean, there's no, you can't go up or down from there. Same thing if you go to negative 2. If you go all the way out to positive 2 or negative 2, there's, no, there's nowhere for the rectangle to go up. So in that case, the area is clearly going to give you 0. So you can check that the area, if you plug in 2 or if you plug in negative 2, the area is going to equal 0. And if you didn't make that connection, same thing. This is the area formula all in terms of x. Plug in 2 or plug in negative 2. You're going to get 0 right here. 0 times anything is 0. So again, it says the area is going to equal exactly 0. Okay, so my only other really critical number here is the square root of 2 that we're going to be using. So the square root of 2... And you could check that this does, in fact, give you a maximum. You know, you could make the number line. So the only values that x could really vary between would be 0 and 2. That's the biggest, you know, x could equal. Right, if you go, and again, it kind of doesn't really make sense because if x goes all the way over to, to where it equals 2, the area is clearly going to equal 0. Likewise, if x equals 0, that means you're just going to the top and bottom of the ellipse. Again, you're going to get an area of 0. So you could check using the first derivative test. Remember, you, that's where you figure out if things are increasing or decreasing. So there's a prime. If you take a number smaller than the square root of 2, uh, 1 would be smaller than the square root of 2, you're going to find that a prime is positive. So that means that the function is increasing. If you take something larger than the square root of 2, it's going to be negative, which means it's decreasing. And if you remember this stuff about where a function is increasing and decreasing, that means, hey, you do have a maximum at square root of 2. So that's kind of the way that you could justify that at square root of 2, you do have, so there is a maximum at square root of 2 when x equals square root of 2. So we're almost there because the question, what did the question actually ask? It said, what is the area of that, of that rectangle? So again, here is a formula for the area of my rectangle, just knowing x. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate the area when I plug in the square root of 2. So I would have 12 multiplied by the square root of 2. Then I would have 1 minus the square root of 2 squared over 4 all raised to the one-half power. So let's see if we can't simplify this down to a, a, a nicer number. Okay, so that's 12 multiplied by the square root of 2. I would have 1 minus, well, the square root of 2 squared is going to be 2. So let's see. So 2 over 4, that's a half. So you have 1 minus a half, which would just leave us with one-half. And again, that's raised to the one-half power. So that's 12 multiplied by the square root of 2. Well, to the one-half power, that's the same thing as taking a square root. So one-half to the one-half power, that's the square root of one-half. So I could take the square root of the top, which is the square root of 1, over the square root of 2. I just break up the root. So that's 12 multiplied by the square root of 2. Well, the square root of 1 is just 1. The square root of 2 would go in the denominator. I could cancel those out. And hey, I'm left with 12 as my solution. So it says the area of that largest rectangle that could be inscribed in there would be 12 square units.